So Dave, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we go into leadership, can you please tell us where did you grow up? Yeah, uh, thanks for the, the invitation and uh, for this opportunity. Um, I spent most of my life in Edenville, uh, out on the East Rand, uh, born and bred a Vailer. Um, hail from the Vale, as they say. And uh, I've spent most of my life uh, growing up locally in the local community, getting to know the local community uh, and serving in the local community as well. So very much a, a focus around, um, I guess it's a smaller town uh, commercially, but quite well situated in terms of business from access through to uh, airport and transport facilities through to um, the, the areas like Sant and the, the, the business areas and a developing area. So not much competition out there, which is a strategic decision. Um, and I guess education and schooling, uh, some funny stories from back then. Um, my mom was a school teacher, so primary school was uh, quite well attended and I was a, a well-behaved schoolboy. Was she your teacher? No, she was not my teacher, oh, fortunately. <laughs> okay. Um, but high school kind of turned things around and the rebel in me came out, I suppose, like a lot of the guys and uh, landed up uh, at Edenvale High School and really a rebel without a clue or a rebel yeah. without a cause, some people would say, and landed up leaving Edenvale. Um, just the, the structures were so formal and structured and I was kind of a out of the boundaries kind of person. Right. Uh, non-conformist, uh, challenge the system wherever, and kind of didn't accept that way of schooling back right. then. So I landed up at Damlin College uh, in Joburg CBD, yeah. Joburg Central, and uh, concluded my matric there um, in about 78, <clears throat> and uh, grew a lot of acquaintances <clears throat> and a lot of people um, that are now uh, the Kirsch family, um, we, we were acquainted with them in our, in our growing up and our schooling. Right. And we used to travel uh, on a really terrible bus system back from Johannesburg to Edenvale every day. And um, so I got to appreciate some of the, the difficulties of commuting and, and traveling right. and trying to do schooling uh, that the traditional government schools were doing and we were doing a school system that was completely different in those days. That was more focused around thinking um, and not having to be in a box. Right. And I think that gave me my foundation around being able to think differently yeah. to the people around me. And so it was an interesting time uh, just growing up locally, small community, and then kind of city centre, hustle, bustle of life. So what was your dream career when you grew, grew up? Uh, totally unrelated to where I am now. The dream career was, I guess, like school uh, boys want to be a fire engine driver or a train driver or something. Yeah. I wanted to be a veterinarian in the wildlife um, mm. situation. So right. a game ranger come veterinarian. And I was well on track for that and then some life changes, some poor decisions, yeah. um, changed my life destination and um, I started a family very, very young in life. Right. Uh, not something I would change now, mm. but um, that derailed mm. my formal progress mm. in terms of uh, following that career. Right. So I had a child, I was 18 mm. and um, it was kind of my responsibility to to bring up the child and to um, be responsible. Mm. Um, my we got married, my wife and I, and th that was very dicey, very rocky, mm. and didn't last for too long. Mm. But my daughter stayed with me and mm. continued with me, so my career direction mm. had to change. So it forced me to reevaluate and relook at a career, and probably made the fatal mistake of taking the career that everyone else wanted for me, which was accounting right. and to become a chartered accountant mm. like everybody else in my family. Mm. 
So I started articles at uh, Aiken and Carter. I did three years of articles, studied at night, mm. and then got home to raise a child and mm. do all the. And after three years, it really just, it was too gray for me. Mm. I, I couldn't deal with the, the boredom of that kind of lifestyle. So I realized it wasn't, that wasn't for me. Right. And so I started, I will call it experimenting with a career and got into, after military, because um, I decided if I can't make things happen, I need to go to the army because we had to go anyway for two years. And I went into the army, <clears throat> landed up um, in the payroll department and doing people's tax returns, mm. funnily enough, in the financial area. So there was a natural ability around finance and the auditing mm. and articles had kind of geared me around financial thinking and mm. financial systems and, and structures. When I came out of the army, kind of was lost as to what to do. So I started again in the financial sector mm. uh, at the motor industry pension fund training as an investment accountant mm. and I kind of again the grey unexciting numbers didn't mm. excite me <laughs> and I landed up at uh, Plessy Communications as again an accountant but a work in progress accountant so dealing with installations dealing with the, the switchboard implementations and they had got into a point where probably 80% of the installations were not getting completed, mm. so they were landing up not billing mm. their project. I took that over uh, and kind of worked myself out of a job mm. within six to seven months. The projects were all up to date, the billing was up to date, and they moved me as a head office accountant. Mm. And again, after a few months, I just this is this is numbers, I'm not. Mm. Uh, I might have an aptitude for it, but it, mm. it doesn't excite me. There's no drive and thrive around that. So the passion was limited. And that's when uh, sitting one night running month end mm. for corporate, um, we decided that if we're going to work this hard, we may as well work this hard for ourselves. Mm. We had been doing people's books um, mm. on computers. We bought a one of the first IBM PCs that came into the country mm. cost the equivalent now if we work at about 250,000 Rand mm. uh, for a PC <laughs> with two drives in it. When was that? Um, this must have been early 80s, uh, 85, 86. Right. And um, so my brother and myself decided he's a chartered accountant, I'm a, a dropout accountant. Mm we were going to start running people's books and we started an accounting bureau. Mm. So there must be a, a fatal attraction to accounting mm. and accounting stuff for me. Um, and we started and we did quite well. And then I started to see the opportunity of not being restricted by a company, by, uh, by the box mm. syndrome. And I started experimenting with doing different things. Mm. The business was making enough money for us to feed our families. Mm. So I started, I ventured out into looking at what complements what we were doing. Mm. Office furniture was a, a growing kind of industry. We hooked up with a guy that manufactured office furniture. Mm. And so we started putting the accounting business in office furniture mm. and selling computers, mm. kind of added on top of that. Right. And that's really where the, the dream started for me. Mm. That's when I realized the entrepreneurial excitement mm. of being able to make a decision today, I'm going to try this thing today. Mm. And if something doesn't work, be able to drop it mm. and not be seen as a failure. Mm. So I tried probably 10 different industry verticals, all related around kind of office business practice. Right. And ultimately landed up with a computer consulting business mm. that was normally ahead of the, not even the leading edge of mm. business, the bleeding edge of technology. Mm. And we always just tried to keep there. Mm. Um, we continued with the accounting business. My brother mm. and I were in the business together. He carried on with the numbers. Mm. 
I carried on with the um, the exciting stuff of right. technology and putting in the first networks uh, mm. at ABI, uh, Amalgamated Beverage Industries. Mm. We put in their very first network. Right. They were a couple of standalone computers. Mm. And I guess this little upstart mm. of a place came in and landed up in mm. Coca-Cola, uh, putting in... Uh, ultimately, I think we put in 13 networks into their organization, mm. which was our kickstarting business. Mm. That was our identification, and we kind of just grew from there and added the technologies as we went. Right. So from wildlife to computers. And, um, and today you're revolutionizing the way that organizations are handling their IT. But before we go there, can you tell us who inspired you in your early days? Yes, um, it was probably more of a what inspired me than a who, right. and then I'll go into the who of uh, who inspired me. Poverty inspired me. Mm. Our family grew up um, in a, a poverty mindset mm. with my mom being a school teacher. The money was low. Mm. Uh, my dad had left home early on in life. Mm. And so there were four kids on a school teacher's salary. We learned minimalistic living, <laughs> mm. if we want to put it nicely in a, a nice frame of mind. Um, and I said, I will not have another generation of poverty mm. following me. So my motivation of success was mm. to break the poverty mindset right. and to move on. Um, having said that with the motivation, I guess my mom was the motivating factor to lift her life out of mm. poverty as well. And so there was a driving force behind that. Um, and then probably the who, um, maybe is not such a popular topic anymore, mm. but really um, I think is that, that desire and the willingness to serve God mm. and to serve the people mm. of the kingdom and the people around who we work with. So I'm very much motivated by things like pay it forward mm. um, in doing good for other people mm. and kind of hoping that they take that same philosophy and pay it forward and pay it forward and work through that. Um, so really driven by breaking the poverty mindset and then serving in an ethical, fair business practice as open as possible right. kind of environment that, that we work in. And Dave, looking back over your career, what would you say was a major turning point? Uh, um, Probably, from a business point of view, was that realization that I'm not a traditional bean counter mm. kind of, with all respect to bean counters, um, I'm not a traditional accountant, mm. and there was more that I needed to be doing. And that realization mm. of being able to be an entrepreneur and evil, even a serial entrepreneur, of trying mm. a whole lot of different things and seeing how they work out. That for me was the start of a turning point. From a life point of view that turned our business around um, was a combination of things. Uh, my mom got cancer and I was given a very short time to live. Mm. I landed up having a cha life change experience through Rick Warren's book Purpose Driven Life mm. and understanding what is life really all about? What is our purpose of being here? Mm. And so through that journey, with journey with my mom, um, through till she died, and kind of taking on that, it's not all about me, mm. uh, life lesson. Mm. That turned things around substantially for the business. It did land up my brother and I split the business. Mm. Um, just I had taken on a, a new kind of rolling business mm. that was more focused around caring for people being able to provide opportunities for people and quite honestly it involved giving away quite a lot of money mm. which didn't reconcile with the traditional mm. business model. So my brother and I agreed we would just separate the business. Mm. He carries on with the accounting business. Our business mm. was naturally split. So we could we could split it. He carried on with mm. that. We're still good friends today. We still refer into mm. each other's businesses. And then I continued the networking and technology business mm. with a new focus which was to do things by the book. Mm. And so that was the turn. 
Now, Dave, you mentioned purpose, purpose of life. What is driving you today? Um, today, the main drive is to create a legacy business mm -hmm. that if I'm gone tomorrow, the business will continue in the light of how my mind and my heart wants it to run mm -hmm. currently, which is we have a business that's grown to almost 40 people currently, mm -hmm. of which I would say probably 30% are what people would uh, call unemployable people. Mm -hmm. People who go for 40, 50, 60, 70 interviews mm -hmm. and sit at home unemployed. Mm -hmm. Our driving force is to rehabilitate people back into the marketplace, not necessarily to stay with us forever. Almost like, uh, if I take the analogy of a dam, mm. a dam without a flow is dead. It mm. dies and it stinks. Mm. A river that flows through a dam mm. with an input and an output mm. flourishes and everything within that dam flourishes. Mm. And we very much want to be that dam mm. to people, uh, especially around youth mm -hmm. and this uh, Cyril Ramaphosa has got this new YES initiative. Mm. Uh, I'm fully embracing that mm. to try and get our youth um, into meaningful employment, mm. meaningful experience and almost re-implement the old apprenticeship mm. system where people can get experience. You can't get a job unless you've got experience. Mm. Uh, how do you get experience if you can't get a job? Mm. So those are the people we're looking to put into a nursery mm. and grow them uh, in the ability of work ethic, mm. culture, pay it forward mm. um, and be there for the other person. Mm. Have somebody else's back. And then to be able to go and do their own thing and mm. go and start that all over again. Now Dave, let us talk about the future of leadership. And I know it's a big question, but what does the future of leadership mean to you? Um, so probably becoming real with technology mm. and real with the different generations, learning how to communicate with um, the youth that are coming through, learning to n negotiate and work with the millennials that mm. are in the workplace and working with them and then also still working with the current generation. Mm. And even to a large extent, the past generation, mm -hmm. not those that have passed on, but mm -hmm. those that are still with us, mm -hmm. that are, I'm busy on another little project called Silver Bullet Consultants. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of silver hair consultants, mm -hmm. um, but my hair's not silver yet completely. Right. <laughs> so I, I, we have a, a joke about being an old bullet mm -hmm. and old bullets have experience. Mm. So, Silver Bullet Consulting is a leadership strategy mm -hmm. to interface people with experience mm. through to previous generations that are coming mm -hmm. through the ranks and being able to take, for example, grade 11 and 12 learners, mm. bring them into a learnership environment, mm. something like Willow Creek do a thing called Global Leadership mm. Summit, and that teaches leadership which encumbers home, mm. workplace, community, mm. and self. And being able to lead, I think going forward, being able to lead oneself mm. is a huge um, lack mm. in people coming through into the workplace. Mm. People are looking to be told what to do, micromanaged, mm. as opposed to being able to self-lead, self-motivate, self-teach. Mm. and add value to an organization. Mm. So I think the leadership strategy, leadership model for the future mm. needs to be much more dynamic than mm. our traditional leadership mm. classroom kind of mm. lecture. And um, I think there's value around um, Gibbs and all of these mm. formal structures of formalization. But I think there's a, a less formal approach mm. where we can influence each other's mm. behavior in making younger people leaders mm. earlier on, as opposed to a lot of my life lessons I learned from 40 onwards. Mm. And I think if I had had the opportunity to learn something from 25, life would be very different mm. to where I am now. So I'd like to lead 
earlier in people's lives. Now, Dave, what have you learned from your own journey that you consider most important for building future leaders? Um, honesty, hmm. ethics, genuineness. Hmm. I think we live in a world where people don't look in each other's eyes anymore. Mm. People don't talk to each other. Mm. And just that ability to be able to, when you ask somebody how they are, mm. to actually listen for the answer mm. and then actually try and do something about it. Mm. We're too fast when, when somebody, and you can test it on a lot of people, we say, how are you? Mm. And they say, fine. And I say, mm. okay, and I'm also fine. And mm. off we go. If you test it and say, I'm actually not doing so well. Mm. How are you? And then they'll carry on talking about mm. themselves. Or they'll say, oh, that's mm. nice. And <laughs> carry on talking. So it's really a genuineness mm. in being able to mm. work with people, listen to people, mm. and open and honest mm. uh, engagement around, I guess, transparency mm. of what the intention is of the relationship. Mm. Are we in this relationship to grow each other? Mm. Are you looking for something from me? Mm. Am I looking for something from you? and then getting into a mentoring kind of mm. uh, leadership role. So I've really learned honesty and openness with whoever you're working with in any environment. Now Dave, when you speak to aspiring leaders, what is it you tell them they should focus on for future-proofing their career? Um, probably to look at, again, technology. And to future-proof, I think we need to look at how fast technology is changing. Mm. So to look back at how we did things before is okay from a learning point of view. Mm. But to future-proof going forward, we need to learn how to work with data. Mm. We need to learn how to work with big data and data analytics. Mm. So that, uh, I, I guess, all the buzz is artificial intelligence mm. and augmented reality and all of these things that are really structured from automating mm. automation. So uh, artificial intelligence is defined by Microsoft is automating automation. Mm. And in order to future proof, I think we need to make sure that the data that we are working with mm. and the sources that we are feeding from are accurate mm. and relevant and real to where we want to mm. go to. Um, and I think probably looking at uh, things like the value of relationship mm. and being able to always be able to turn to people mm. because people buy from people, mm. people work with people and mm. all of the automation and mobile devices and work from home environments mm. might be technologically sound mm. but from a human being point of view we need interaction, mm. we need people. So I would say if we combine technology Mm. and hone our personal uh, skills and our personality mm. skills uh, with relevant data, I think we will be able to future-proof what we're doing, no matter mm. what the product is. Mm. As long as we have that strategy going forward, I think we'll be okay. Now, Dave, you are leading a technology company. Um, can you tell us, in your mind, what are the technologies, or maybe the tools of technology, that will enable the future of leadership? Yeah, that must be a one-word answer, but with a long explanation behind it. Analytics. Mm. Data, again, I think data going forward is mm. everything. The more we have, the more we know, the more we can do. Mm. The more data we have, the more accurate our um, various technologies will be. Mm. So being able to work with augmented reality mm. in, I guess, if if we t take a rural situation mm. where there's no hospital, no doctor, and yet somebody needs an operation, mm. that technology of data and data growth and our development around uh, artificial intelligence, mm. augmented reality, we're going to be able to have somebody put on a device mm. somewhere out in the bush Mm. and perform an operation on somebody to save mm. their life. Mm. And I think that's really the future is data, data analytics, and the tools around mm. accepting the fast 
pace mm. of change. Mm. Without data, mm. we will be dead. Mm. So with the sooner we embrace mm. big data, I guess is what they call the, mm. the terminology, but just the fact that our data mm. is out there, um, mm. a lot of it unprotected, as we've seen from some of the hacks uh, with our passports and our IDs and sure. uh, dates of birth and all of those things, mm. some of the bigger hacks around some of the big corporates mm. and enterprises. So things like poppy compliance, GDPR mm. compliance become more and more important even though people currently are not taking it seriously. Mm. As data becomes more critical, mm. I want my data to be protected. Sure. So the security and the technology around protecting of data mm. and data analytics and who can see what mm. of my data is critical. Mm. Things like social media, mm. I think we take way too lightly in terms of what we put onto Facebook mm. and Instagram and mm. it's really just feeding people with information that should be private. Mm. But yet the feeling is the whole world must know who I am mm. for my five minutes of fame, I think I mm. don't know, as opposed to restricting our so social media profile mm. and having relevant profiles and mm. different profiles for different requirements. Mm. So I might have a profile group for my family and my immediate family where we can talk about the pictures of the kids and the grandkids mm. and, and what's going on. Mm. There will be a social media for my work persona mm. and then there might be one for a mentorship persona mm. that and I feed different things into each different mm. persona as to what I want consumed uh, publicly. Mm. So I think people just need to be very careful what they put mm. onto their social media profiles mm. and make sure that it's relevant. Um, I said, make sure your social media profile represents the truth mm. about who you are mm. so that people don't land up getting banned from countries because they put mm. something on Facebook or Twitter mm. about their political beliefs mm. or their racist beliefs. Mm. Those things need to be kept uh, as everything, personal stuff should remain mm. personal. My viewpoints about other people mm. should remain personal mm. and not put out onto the public sector. Right. So that data, we need to be careful mm. how we deal with the data, but we need to use the data mm. in order to develop the technologies that we need. Now Dave, um, your own technology firm um, we met in Clarence and I overheard you talking to your colleagues about the innovative solutions that you are implementing in big companies. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you are innovating the way that organizations are handling their IT? Yes, um, without giving away the trade secret. <laughs> sure. Um, part of my belief structure when I, when I had that life-changing experience uh, was to say Business is not all about money. Mm. Business is about getting into a relationship, becoming part of mm. our staff, knowing people's life situations, knowing their personal situations, and then the same thing with our clients and our customers. Mm. So to be able to go into a customer, listen to what they are saying, but really to understand what they say. Mm. So somebody might initially talk about they have a problem with a computer system or security mm. or ransomware or crypto locker. Mm. Uh, but they, they're also saying that they are struggling with something mm. in their business, they can't implement this. So our strategy, first of all, is to ask how are they personally mm. in the business. We generally deal with decision makers uh, in the business environment mm. that we get into. So we're talking about how are you dealing with that ransomware attack, how are you dealing mm. with the data that you lost, all your whole mm. accounting system is gone, or your, your whole email system mm. is gone. How is that impacting you? Mm. What can we do to help that aspect mm. first? And that's when some of those leadership characteristics come in that we learn from Global Leadership Summit and all of the leadership forums, mm. is that interpersonal skill. Mm. How to listen when somebody's crying out for help. Mm. Uh, not a business solution, not a product. They're looking for help in themselves to be able to deliver a, an answer to their company. Mm. Whether it's their own or whether they're employed by the company, it doesn't matter. Mm. And then we'll work through that and try and understand that and then start developing the solutions behind that. 
So there's a personal understanding of what they need to take care of um, from a, right. a human being point of view first, mm. and then from a product point of view. Mm. Having said that, we do have a set of products that we evaluate once a year, and we, we kind of cookie cut our mm. solution. Over the years we've tested, it is not based on the most expensive enterprise mm. technology. We believe that there are products just as good, mm. sometimes better, that are cheaper. Mm. And we give those products a fair shake in mm. terms of implementing at our customers. Mm. We train and specialize on this suite of products, mm. and then we will see which products apply to our customers. Mm. We never ever have a rip and replace mm. mentality. We will work with what they've got. If it's technology we don't understand, we will either outsource it or we will learn it. Mm. And sometimes we've picked up product from going into customers and identifying and they're using a product that's quite obscure, mm. um, but it becomes one of our products in our product set uh, because it does a very good job. And the trade secret uh, really is to look at what is IT costing, what is technology mm. costing the organization, and how can we implement a solution mm. at a vastly cheaper price mm. with equal or better outcomes. And that is how we apply um, our strategy mm. into our customers. And we have got success stories of cutting uh, IT costs from 6 million rand a month to 300,000 rand a month. Mm. And the system works better mm. than it did before. And it's through enterprises develop, um, I don't want to call them kingdoms, they, they develop big, massive systems because people need to, the CIO mm. and the uh, CFO and all of these guys, they, they need to have more control and more power. So mm. they build an empire. Mm. Um, around technology, mm. which makes them more important, which justifies salaries, mm. which really makes them bulletproof mm. in that organization. Mm. We come in and we try and work with that and look at, uh, do you need all 15 of these people mm. operating in this business mm. um, sector? And often through our systems, we reduce 15 people down to five people. Mm. And those other 10 people land up getting deployed either in our customers in other places mm. um, if they are valuable people they get deployed within the organization mm. and absorbed into different areas so it's a realignment of of skills and resources mm. so we provide systems that are rock solid mm. really affordable mm. and well managed through our infrastructure mm. at a much cheaper price than the enterprise and uh, core product that are out there and I believe you're branching out into Africa? Yes. Internationally? Yes. Um, we are. We, we just recently opened a mm. Cape Town office uh, two months ago. We've, we've opened up Cape Town. Um, we, we had an excursion into Namibia a mm. little while ago, and we are heading back to Namibia next year to, with having learned some school fees mm. of how to operate um, around the visa and work permit mm -hmm. requirements. I was naive and I, th I thought it was an open area mm. to do business and it's not. Uh, they have quite strict regulations. So we'll re-venture into that. And we operate around Sierra Leone, DRC, mm. Zambia, mm. Lesotho. We've got some uh, quite sizable diamond mine operations mm. that are doing quite well for us. Um, and we have a small office in Dubai mm. that we, we run our contracts and administration from. So we spread out all over the place. Mm. And technology allows us to be wherever we need mm. to be. We don't have to be based locally in an office. So remote worker is, is definitely for us mm. an advantage uh, using our systems that we've got. Now Dave, as a mentor to future leaders, um, can you share maybe a success story where you mentored somebody and that person took your advice to heart? Mm. Yeah, it probably goes back, I have to calculate, it might be six or seven years, mm. uh, sitting in my office, and I landed up with two young guys sitting at my desk in front of me. They had known of me through mm. 
my brother's uh, maid, I think it was, who they, they wanted to get their kids into IT. And they sat and said, listen, we've just come out of university. We know nothing. Mm -hmm. We just want to work. We'll work for free. So when somebody says they'll work for free, my ears open. Mm -hmm. I'm not Scottish for nothing. <laughs> um, and so um, we, we gave them the opportunity. One landed up going to work for my brother as an accountant. He had a, a more accounting uh, background and desire. And Tobani landed up working with me. And we spent months. Mm. He's like a sponge. Mm. And I still mentor with him today. Mm. Uh, he's like a sponge. He calls me his white grandfather. Mm. And if he's got a problem, if he's got a need, if he's got an idea, he's very creative. Mm. So if he's got an idea, he comes and says, I'm going to try this thing, what do you think? Mm. And then we'll go through and look at that. He worked um, in IT. He's an IT graduate, BSc, computer mm. science. Um, but his flair, like mine, wasn't numbers. Mm. His is not technical computing. Mm. His is creative computing. So graphic media mm. design. So we worked with him. I landed up um, with a friend of mine who was running um, Mullen Lowe they, today. Um, they one of the large graphic and media companies in the country. Um, we landed up placing Tobani uh, in a mentorship program with them around creative writing and mm. creative design. And he's so well entrenched there now um, that he's, he's traveling backwards and forwards to mm. Cape Town and he's doing something that is so passionate for him mm. uh, and it's also technology related mm. so he's using those technologies and I think we kind of took the lid off him mm. where he thought he had to go and be an IT technician mm. sitting in an office working on computers mm. and just through exploring and he used to come and do a leadership with me every Tuesday evening mm. we run a um, a church leadership program mm. but it applies to business and it applies to life mm. and he, he came and he sat with us for about three years mm. and just sucked up all the information mm. out of those sessions and today uh, he's thriving and doing mm. very well with an investment strategy coming mm. up that we we help him helping him design mm. um, to get into property investment mm. and start becoming a taku Mm. That is his dream and his ambition, mm. um, is to be mm. uh, well known because of his philanthropic um, outreach right. and through his ability uh, to work with people mm. and to influence people. So really a nice story to have watched. Now Dave, are there any role models of leadership that you would suggest future leaders should study and maybe learn from? Yes, I have a long list. <clears throat> Um, I believe in the accountability system mm -hmm. where we have a create a platform, an environment where we can bounce ideas off each other mm. and where you can say to me, last month you said you were going to be doing X, Y and Z, mm. have you done it? Mm. And so it makes us accountable to each other. Mm. I've got a group of people I meet with, um, some I mentor, some mentor me. Mm that on a personal level, we work mm. as an accountability group. There's about 10 to 15 of these people mm. that I meet with uh, breakfast regularly, and we, we have those accountabilities. But a mentor doesn't have to be a living person that you can talk to. Mm. For me, a mentor can be an author of a book, mm. or somebody who's told a story through a movie, mm. or somebody who's done something, I guess like Richard Branson, where we're sitting in a boardroom, mm. Uh, in the middle of a gym mm. and this is a business dynamic mm. that plants something in my brain mm. so there's been a mentorship mentorship seed planted mm. just by me coming to sit mm. here today so their mentors are all over the place right. but to name a few that have been influence, influential in my life uh, Andy Stanley uh, who's a, a Christian leader John Maxwell uh, very well known Jim Collins mm. uh, some good stuff a guy called Craig Grishel, mm. uh, who's also a leadership developer. Dr. Henry Cloud, mm. Jack Welsh's model, I think is studied and even today is still relevant for us. 
Laszlo Bock mm -hmm. for, for his HR stuff at Google mm -hmm. uh, has influenced how we do things. Then there's a really funny guy called Sam Chand, mm -hmm. who is a motivational speaker who goes around teaching government, mm -hmm. teaching business leader, leaders, church mm -hmm. leaders, uh, humility and a humble beginning can lead to greatness. Mm. And he talks about the leadership pains and the, in growing there's going to be pain mm. and you've got to push through some of the pains that you'll end up mm. going through as a leader. He uh, went from India to America to find his future. Mm. He landed up being the janitor, cleaning the toilets at a university. Mm. Today he's the chancellor of the university. Mm. And he says he always risks the temptation mm. to tell those people who made him clean the toilets mm. to go and clean the toilets themselves. Mm. <laughs> so re really mm. interesting. Simon Sinek is also another really current speaker mm. that I listen to a lot. Cheryl Sandberg mm. uh, from, from Facebook. Mm. Just an amazing story of, again, leadership pain. Mm. Uh, when her husband died a little while ago mm. and she thought the, her world was finished. Mm. and to be built up through a system and people around mm. to be able to recover from that and be a stronger person mm. uh, having come through that where she relied a lot on her husband. So that, that also is a very good lesson and a local guy, mm. Eric Kruger mm. uh, from, he runs a, a thing called Better Man mm. which is a, it's a daily email that he sends out mm. with short sharp snippets mm. and some wisdom that goes with it mm. and builds a case uh, he's just released a book uh, this month waiting for my delivery of it uh, that builds up leaders mm. uh, so he would be a, a leadership coach mm. um, in terms of his description of it as a right. person but the input and the wisdom mm. i use that stuff nearly every day mm. so those are some of the people that influence my life Now, Dave, how can people get hold of you and how should they connect with you? So, based on what I said earlier, uh, some of my, my profiles are private mm -hmm. and I'm still a bit of a dinosaur. I still live in email, the email mm -hmm. world. And my venturing into primarily, I guess I'm probably around LinkedIn the most mm -hmm. and have some input and some consumption around LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook is very, very seldom a tool for mm. me um, because of the personal nature of it. We have a, a Facebook page for First Consulting um, and people can visit mm. that. Uh, to hook up with me on LinkedIn mm. and I'm reasonably active on that. Mm. Instagram and those other mechanisms I really don't subscribe to mm. because I'm just so wary of that. What I'm putting out on the social mm. media platform Sometimes you can say something perfectly innocent and offend mm. somebody else. So mm. I try to keep those profiles restricted mm. and limited to the persona that mm. we need to talk to. So from a business point of view, hook me up on LinkedIn and, mm. and we can chat. And Dave, last but not least, is there one piece of advice that you would really like to convey to future leaders that they should implement in their own leadership? Mm. Through years of learning, this is probably what I would say. I would say listen to a lot of leaders. Mm. Listen a lot. Mm. But don't do what everybody says. Mm. Select three or four of those leaders mm. whose character and ethic and personality appeals to you. Mm. And listen to their lingo. If their lingo talks to you, then listen to them mm. and kind of work with them And then invest your energy in following and modeling around what they do mm. and build a, um, a model, mm. a Frankenstein of your own. Mm. Don't try and be somebody else. Mm. Build your own Frankenstein from taking parts of mm. different people who can make up who you are. Mm. You are an individual and I think you need to be individual because your gifts and skills mm. are from there. Um, and then see what you can do reach out get involved in leadership roles mm -hmm. get involved in 
organizations mm. serving communities. Mm. You'll be amazed how many other business people mm. are serving in a feeding queue mm. in a local church somewhere mm. or in a uh, informal settlement mm. on a Saturday morning mm. reaching out and feeding people or clothing mm. people. They are executives and they are just waiting to talk to you. Mm. Most of our business comes from those kind of uh, interactions. And then honesty and integrity, those are key characters, characteristics in any relationship. So be sure to be authentic in relationships. And my personal motto, look to pay it forward whenever possible. Mm. Life will change for you mm. and for everyone around you when you pay it forward. Mm. That's all I can say about that. Well, Dave, thank you very much for sharing your life story and your insights and wisdom. Thank you. And, and showing us that business can actually play a good role in society and that sometimes maybe community should come first. Yes. And that we, would, that we all need to interact with a lot more integrity and I think a lot more caring. Yes, a bigger heart. A bigger heart. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you for the opportunity.